Oh, great. Do you know that the last song also, and there's another verse about heaven? <laughs> so every time, even though you don't consciously look for it, it's in there. Um, so it's good. I, I, I forgot how the verse goes, but it talks about heaven. Um, well, you know, the Bible talks a lot about heaven, even though we don't condense it to one particular topic. Uh, but that's what we've been doing for the past three weeks already. This is the fourth week, and we're condensing it into um, one particular topic about heaven. Well, to start tonight, um, as we begin, we just want to give a little a general overview of what we've done so far. Um, we talked about where heaven is. Actually, what heaven is. And heaven is a what? A place. And I wonder if we, if we think that through, um, because there's a lot of mystical stuff associated with heaven, but heaven is actually a place. And where is heaven? Up. And uh, I was thinking about it the other day. There was an, um, David Jeremiah actually spoke on heaven. And I was checking his notes to see if his notes actually link up with mine. Uh, yeah, it does. <laughs> But he's much senior than me, so I kind of see if my notes, if I was teaching what was correct. But it's very interesting how he has um, uh, talked about heaven and he condensed it into one sermon. So we talked about what heaven is. It's a place. Where heaven is, is also up. And what is heaven like? And so we talked about that as well. And we referred to two individuals. Remember last week when we, re we read through that entire section with Ezekiel from Ezekiel chapter 1? talk about the angelic beings and talk about these beasts and also talk, talked about the wheel in the middle of the wheels and stuff like that. So he was trying to describe heaven. And then even John, um, John in the book of Revelation, he was called up into heaven and um, he actually had a vision of heaven himself. But two things that both of them actually refer to, the first one was heaven's throne. Both of them refer to a throne both of them refer to uh, someone sitting on the throne, and he gave the appearance of a man. Um, so the question would be, um, when you think about that, uh, is can we see God? And there we went into silence. <laughs> I mean, what form does God take? Is, does, is God man? But we know that God became man and dwelt among us, and that's Jesus Christ, right? But the question, can we see God? Well, God is a spirit. Um, and also, too, in other portions of Scripture, God is described as light. And so for them, both Ezekiel as well as John, when they refer to the idea of seeing someone in the appearance of a man sitting on a throne, and so we talked about that last week. So one was the throne. Um, talked about the book of Revelation mentions the throne of God 39 times. You know, and we did talk about how many times heaven was mentioned in scripture. Um, this was good for me because it talks about the idea of 39 times the mention of God's throne in the book of Revelation itself. And it also too, it talks about heaven's temple. And in Revelation 3, it says that there was a temple in heaven where the saints never leave. It is an immense, in, infinite, eternal temple. In fact, the Lord himself and the Lamb are the temple. And so we see that in the book of Revelation chapter 21. And in the eternal heaven, God will spread his infinite presence over his people as a temple. So when it gets into the book of Revelation 21, 22, it talks about there is no temple in heaven because God is the temple. And so two things, the throne the throne of God and the temple of God. And both Ezekiel and John referred to both of those in their um, description of heaven. Okay? Now, we're going to be looking at a specific focus tonight. Um, I like how this author, author kind of um, moved this uh, as he began to develop this concept, because where we came out of what heaven is, where heaven is, and what heaven is like, now we're moving into this concept of we're talking about the New Jerusalem, but he want to give a specific focus before we actually get into the New Jerusalem. So the to topic for tonight, when we begin to think it through at the end of the night, we'll be talking about the New Jerusalem, all right, the New Jerusalem. I had the privilege of going to Jerusalem, <laughs> Um, and that Jerusalem was um, not the same Jerusalem as it was in the past, 
because there is no temple in Jerusalem. And the only part of Jerusalem that we actually saw of the temple was this wailing wall. And we actually went to the wailing wall, me and Scotty. Um, that was a very dangerous time because they only had Jews that were doing their stuff there. And we were wondering whether or not we as Gentiles can actually sit among the Jews. But it was a very interesting time. So we're going to talk about the new Jerusalem and how it comes down out of heaven. So we're still in the topic of heaven, but as we talk about heaven, we're going to talk about the new Jerusalem. But before we get into that, we're going to talk about the new heaven and the new earth. The new heaven and the new earth. Now, um, I know that you didn't get, I didn't know if anyone, I know one person actually may have read these notes before tonight. I know that's one person, that's Brother Milton, because he called me and uh, asked me to make a correction on my notes. So I did make a correction on my notes. I, I think he read the whole thing before, <laughs> well, before tonight. But what we're going to look at is that we're going to look, we're not going to go, we're going to go into Revelation 21, but I just want to, we're going to refer to Revelation 21, 1 and 2. And it, well, let me, let me go back a little bit just to catch up where we are. Um, tonight we're going to be looking at a special focus before we get into actually talking about the new Jerusalem. Um, but we're talking about the new heaven and the new earth. Um, in Revelation 21 verses 1 and 2, I'm not going to read it here now, but we're going to read it a little later in our notes. It describes in, in uh, more detail what heaven is like by describing the new heaven and the new earth. In the universe, the stellar bodies, the moon, the planets, compose the present heaven, and we occupy the earth. Someday God will renovate the universe and make a new heaven and a new earth. And we know that. I, I think you all may have read this before in Scripture. It's a part of Second Peter chapter 3. Um, he talks about this whole idea of God is going to actually destroy what we presently know as our earth, which is now, and he's going to renovate some people use the word renovate. He's going to change the heavens. He's going to just change the heavens. Okay? Now, this was prophesied in the Old Testament by the Old Testament prophets about this renovation. Through Isaiah, God says, Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I created. Not Isaiah 65, 17 and 18. So even in the time of Isaiah, you know when you go through the Old Testament? How many of you have read through the Old Testament like at least once, one, one time a year? You know you go to your reading or you're listening to something, you're hearing the reading. And you don't pick up on these verses and tell, tell someone actually takes that verse which says heavens in it and kind of pulls it out. This is what has happened to me. So in one sense, he talks about this heaven. And God is actually saying he's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. So if he's going to create new heavens and a new earth, what's going to happen to the old one? What's going to happen to the old one? So in Isaiah 66, 22, God says, The new heavens and the new earth which I will endure before, sorry, which I will make will endure before me, declares the Lord. So presently, the earth that we live on, the heavens that we've been talking about, which is the sky, and then we talked about the atmosphere, and then we talk about the, the, the space, all of that is going to actually be dissolved. So the heavens as we know it right now will not be the heavens and the earth when we get into the eternal state. And we'll see some of that as we go along. But also quoting from Psalms 102, 25 to 27, he, in the writing in Hebrews in chapter 1, verses 10 to 12 says, Thou, Lord, in the beginning didst lay the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands, and they will perish. But thou remainest, and they all will become old as a garment, and as a mantle thou will roll them up. As a garment they will also be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years will not come to an end. So we see here that even in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, in the book of the Psalms, God has already mentioned that he's going to do away with this former heaven and earth, and he's going to bring in a new heavens and new earth. Okay? So if you invest a lot of time and energy and stuff in this present earth, you know, it's all going to be wrapped up. <laughs> taken away is going to be no more. So someday God will change the present heaven and earth. So let's look at what he did. 
Let's say by the time we reach Revelation 21, which is way in, 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 in the, uh, the end of our Bible, in the last book in our Bible, almost the woman towards the last chapter in our Bible, the Battle of Armageddon had been fought. And so it kind of give you a chronological setting. The, the Battle of Armageddon had been fought. The thousand year early reign of Christ has come to an end. And at the great white throne, God has sentenced Satan and all the ungodly to eternal hell. Then the whole universe, and think of this, the whole universe except hell is dissolved and God will create a new heaven and a new earth that is so magnificent no one will remember, no one will remember the first. So if you, re if you read the book of Revelation and as you come to um, chapter 19, 20, 21, 22, you begin to see there's a certain order, chronological order of things happening. And as they're happening, then you begin to realize that God is in the process of replacing the old with the new. The former earth and the former heavens, he's changing. Okay? We see that in the book of Revelation. What's happening in the book of Revelation? A lot of things are going on. Some of the things that are going on, you have... Um, the seals being broken, you have the bowl judgments, then you have the trumpet judgments, and as a result of that, you have the water being affected, the drinking water being affected, you have the seas being affected, you have the islands of the sea disappearing, then there's catastrophe after catastrophe after catastrophe. God is in the process of renovating, but he doesn't destroy it right then because the battle of Armageddon will be fought, thousand year reign by Christ and after that you begin to see the great white throne judgment the heavens and the earth as we know it will actually disappear and when God brings in the new heaven and the new earth it is so magnificent that no one would remember the first heaven and earth all we know is this one right all we know is this one which we presently lived on as we live on and second Peter chapter 3 verse 10 says but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements would melt with fervent heat both the earth and on the works that are in it will be burnt up so this earth you know um, we always um, we're looking we're watching the news right now um, we see this buildup of on the Ukraine border by the Russians. We see NATO and the United States trying to negotiate some peace treaty there. And everybody's afraid that a war would break out. And as a result of the war, then man, because of their nuclear armory, they'll be able to destroy one another. You know, man will not destroy himself. God will destroy the earth. He will destroy and the words that they use there says that he's coming like a thief in the night. And how will the heavens pass away? With a great noise. And I, I'm not sure what that sound will be like, but it's a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and everything will be burnt up. So in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, Peter describes it according to his promise. And you can see the references there. We are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So we're looking for a new one. Um, and then since Satan fell, the earth and the first two heavens have been under God's curse. You agree? Are we living in a cursed earth? <laughs> we live in a cursed earth. Um, remember that in Genesis 3.17, God says, Cursed is the ground because of you. And through the sweat of your brow, you will what? Bread. Eat bread. You know, can you imagine what kind of work Adam did before the fall and he didn't have the sweat and the ground just produced what he needed? The fruits, the vegetables, whatever Adam ate before the fall. But this earth is cursed because of sin. And in Job 15, 15 says, the heavens are not pure in his sight. Isaiah 24, 5 says, the earth is also polluted by its inhabitants. We live in a polluted universe but God is going to remake it. And you know, there's a lot of talk recently about climate change. Y'all been hearing the conversations? We got to cut down on our carbon footprint, they call it. Um, 
you know, and we got to cut back and fossil fuels and coal and all the rest of that. And um, we're feeling the effects of it through the major hurricanes that are coming through. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I want to say we don't have to worry about climate change. When God begins to deal with the earth, it ain't going to be climate change. It's going to be judgment. So in one sense, we live in what they would call a disposable planet. Not that you, do, you, you just throw everything away and don't want to do nothing with the planet, but it's just that the fact is we live in this world, we enjoy this world, we enjoy the benefits of this world, but at the same time, too, we have to be very careful. You know, God has given us the opportunity to live here so that we can actually live and abide on this earth. But the earth, it wasn't polluted. It didn't say it was polluted by trash. It says it's polluted by its inhabitants. Man pollutes the earth. Man. Because even when you get into um, the book of um, when the Lord was sending the children of Israel, when they crossed the Jordan into the promised land, they were supposed to take out all of the people that were dwelling in the land of Canaan. God said that one of the reasons why he wanted them to destroy those individuals was that the land was ready to vomit them out. It got to the point where these people polluted the land so much with their idolatry and wickedness and sin that God says the land is actually getting to the point of wanting to just th vomit them right out. So we live in a, a beautiful earth, but we, we have polluted the earth. Don't worry. All right, we get technology here. But let's look at how it is illustrated. And I just want to kind of help us to see as things begin to change. In 2 Peter 3, 3 to 7, it says, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For, from, for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they will willingly forget, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. How are the heavens and the earth will be destroyed? By fire. They're not going to be destroyed by water anymore. How many of you have ever watched the movie 2012? You watched that before? You watched that? Oh, that was a recent movie within the last few years, last decade. But what was very interesting about that was that they wanted to actually build these arcs because they believed that the, the Mayans believed that this world, when the planets lined up and the heat from the sun is going to cause certain, what do you call it, crust dis displacement. And then, Everything is just going to go ahead, and what are they going to do? Water is just going to just flood. Water is just going to flood. And so, but the God is not, God already destroyed this world before with what? Water. But now he's going to destroy this earth that we're living in right now with fire. So, let me ask you this. Do you all believe in the flood? Yeah, there's only one flood. Do you believe in, if you say you believe in a flood, then the next question would be, do you believe there was a global flood? See, even in that, as you begin to think that through, because that happened in the book of Revelation, when Noah built this ark, and Noah, the Lord told him to build the ark, and he actually built it for 120 years, and then the flood came. Where did this water come from? And in the book of Genesis, it talks about the water above and the water below, and it rained for 40 days, and it just rise, and it covered the largest mountain at that point in time, that when he sent the birds out to find whether or there was any land, they couldn't find it. So they came back only until the last one, when he found a leaf, because the water was receding. The Bible teaches that there was a global flood that covered the earth. And that's how God destroyed that generation of people. He wiped out a generation of people using the flood. And so when the scoffers come and say, hey, where's the sign of his coming? Everything remains as it is. No, everything didn't remain as it was. The conditions of the earth before the flood is not the same conditions of the earth after the flood. 
things change in the atmosphere. Animals didn't live as long. Man didn't live as long as they used to. Methuselah, he lived to be what? 969 years. That's a long time. But what happened was, right after that, Abraham died at the age of 175. So it was changing. So what he's saying here, the heavens of old changed. God destroyed the world with the flood, but now he is reserved for this heavens and earth that we know right now. It's not going to be destroyed by the flood no more. It's going to be destroyed by what? Fire. He's going to destroy this earth with fire. And so verses 3 and 4 says, those men reasoned that there had never been a cat catalytic judgment on the earth so why should they expect one now which is a logical is as logical as saying i know i never die because I've, i haven't as yet and you know scientists really today begin to think through and they talk about billions of years ago and the evolving of our planet they deny willfully deny that they see evidences of a major flood and that's where you have this genesis um, answers in Genesis, you can go to Kentucky and actually go into the ark, the big ark. But again, you was there? I went there. I went and I went into the ark. It's very, it's a massive ship. And the way they have it laid out according to the, the best as they can. But it's interesting because you built this ark out in Kentucky. Out in Kentucky. And you ask the question, why? Where are you getting the drawings from? But is an evidence of what Noah built when he built the ark. And verses 5 and 6 of that says, Those who say that there was no judgment on the earth, forget about the flood when God drowned the entire human race, sparing only Noah and his family. So we see God was at work even then. And why? Because there is judgment coming. Prior to the flood, a canopy of water encircled the earth, protecting it from the sun's ultraviolet rays. Because of that protection, plant life flourished, and anim men and animals live hundreds of years, as I said. But because of man's sin, God caused that canopy to inundate the earth. Peter's saying that the flood illustrates the day when God will renovate the entire earth again, but in a much greater way than the, ex than the Genesis flood. He will destroy the whole earth. And so the focus of this writer is to help us to understand that when we think of heavens, when we think of the heavens of the heavens, we got to realize that this present earth and this present heavens as we see it will cease to exist. There will be no more. And it's going to be because of judgment. Now, verses 6 and 7 says, The world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water, but the presence, heaven, and earth, by his word, are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. And in verse 10 of 2 Peter 3, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with immense heat, and the earth and his works will be burnt up. Now think of this. Atomic, atomic science has demonstrated to us that such destruction can occur. Because you remember when they dropped that bomb on Hiroshima? That was an atomic bomb. And that killed, and it had an effect when they dropped that bomb. But they have another bomb. You know what they call that one? Nuclear. What man has done was he takes an atom and he splits it. And he sees the tremendous power that it has. He takes a nucleus of an atom, splits it, and he also sees the power that it has. Nuclear is very, is very useful if you use it in the right way. Because I mentioned last week, we have aircraft carriers, not us, but the U.S. and the other parts of the world, have aircraft carriers right now. They build them with nuclear engines. They don't have to fuel up, stop and fuel up. They can go for years without fueling up because they have nuclear energy. So man understands the power in the atom and the nucleus. And what that has done is, by splitting the atom, man unleashed the potential for unbelievable destruction. And we see it. You drop a bomb, an atom, atomic bomb, and you see the devastation that, that creates. But can you imagine when God, um, the Lord says, it just, pff, the earth burns up with intense heat? 
Where did that intense heat come from? From the elements. Our earth has tremendous potential for fire. We live on the crust of a fireball. Most of the earth, approximately 8,000 mile diameter, is molten flame. And we all know this. You kind of did this in science. You had this crust of the earth that we're, we're on, and inside the inner part of the earth is a lava flow burning. And when do we see it? When do we see the effects of that? When you have what a volcano. <laughs> You see the amount of power that comes from a volcano? The latest one, you all you remember the latest one that he had in the news? It was in the, it was in the, it was in the ocean, right? It was in the ocean. And it exploded. And by the time it hit the surface, it went so far in the air. I mean, this is in the water. They're underwater. And it shoot that out of the, through the water. And it's amazing the power and the energy that is created because of what's inside our planet. And so... The earth's core is flaming, boiling, li liquid, liquid lake of fire, which when it gets too close to the earth's crust, it bursts out through a volcano. Someday, God will unleash his power and destroy the whole universe with fire. And so we just see it. It's just going to happen. Um, um, God, the Bible teaches that God holds all things together. But then when, just imagine when God releases things it just explodes and it cre creates a chain reaction that kind of affects the whole planet that we live on now in revelation 22 1 and 2 this is what it says now i saw a new heaven and a new earth this is John, after the, like we said, after the battle of Armageddon, after the millennium reign of Christ, after the great white throne judgment, after Satan is thrown into the lake of fire, well, with all those who do not believe in God, then God destroys the present earth and the heavens. And what does God do? He creates a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. John speaks of a new heaven and a new earth, and the Greek word translated new stresses that the earth God will create will not just be new as opposed to old, but also it will be different. Different. On that new earth, there will be no sea. You can't go to the beach. <laughs> There'll be no beach. <laughs> There'll be no oceans. There'll be no sea. Now, how that works out, I do not know. All we know is this is what John's seeing. And this new earth will be so different from the one that we know. And the new heavens will be totally different from what we know. We haven't ventured far. We only have sent satellites or we have sent telescopes out. But we have never beyond, went beyond that as man. So we don't know what's out there. But even that is going to change. The same word that Paul uses, the same Greek word in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says, if any man be in Christ, he's a what? New creature. That's the same word. Meaning you're not just new as opposed to old. You are a different creature. So when you come to Christ. You, when God, Jesus transformed you, you're saved. He changes you from one thing to another. And you're in a man. So the quality has changed. The new heavens and the earth will, like our newness in the Christ, will be glorified, free from sin's curse, and it will be eternal. Now, let's talk about our earth. Today, our earth has spots of beauty. You agree? You all don't agree? <laughs> there are spots of beauty. So when I'm, when I'm talking about the destruction of that, I'm talking about our earth being a disposable planet. But yeah, there are spots. That you go to certain places and you see the landscape and the design. Especially when at night when they do all the lighting. It's beautiful, right? There's carpeted with grass, with flowers. And sometimes when you look at the crops uh, in Indiana, you're driving down through Indiana, you drive past in the cornfields. But when you see the cornfields and the soybean fields, amazing agricultural and they, how they have a design, it's, it's beautiful. And then you have shady trees spanned by snow capped mountains and flowing with crystal streams. We see that. 
We see that, the beauty that our earth has. But nevertheless, it is marred by disease, death, pollution, and the miseries of godlessness. And we could, we could, we could say amen to that too. Because we see disease, we see death, and we see pollution. And then also, our, but our present heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. Then God will create new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Only then will the universe stop groaning under the curse of sin. Because even in Romans, it talks about the fact, Romans 8, 19 to 22, it talks about the earth groaning. It's groaning because why? The earth was cursed when Adam sinned and is waiting for the redemption of the sons of God. So we see that also there. But then it says, every believer will live in the new earth. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. And that's a part of the Beatitudes. It will then be unnecessary to pray for God's will to be done on earth, as it is in heaven, because we will, be, we will reign on earth. So it's no more longer us praying, Father, let your will be done on heaven as it is done on earth. No. All we say is, let your will be done. Why? Because everywhere... Everybody is doing the will of God. No different. So, Revelation 21, when John adds, there is no longer any sea. And some, I'll just read to you what some of the scholars have actually talked about. This, that is an intru, intru, intriguing statement that can be interpreted several different ways. One, some Bible, some Bible scholars think that it means that there will be no national boundaries. Others point out that the sea symbolized fear to the ancients. So they believe the absence of the sea implied the absence of fear. Both are true. In the new heaven and earth, nothing will make us afraid and nothing will separate us from other people. In Revelation 21, 2, John says that the only water in heaven is the river of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its streets and on either side of the river was the tree of life. So we're going to have no sea, Sister Brenda, no beach. But you'd have a river flowing, all right? I don't know how long that river is, how wide that river is. I do not know. It doesn't say. But it says, coming out of the God's throne and flowing down Heaven Main Street is a crystal clear river. There will be no boundaries, separation, or mysterious violent seas. You know, we like the water. How many of you like the water? How many of you like our beaches, our water? All of us like it when it's nice and calm, right? But when you get into a boat and you go out there and you have a rough time, how many of you have ever been out on the sea when it's rough? Did you enjoy your experience? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I was out there as well, and I don't like the experience. You want to find land very quickly, any land, just to get off the boat. But then there is no more seas. Now, with that in mind, the new heavens and the new earth is in place. This is going to happen in the future. It's not going to happen right now. So I think you can still enjoy your yard. You can still enjoy planting some flowers. You can still enjoy the beach. You can still enjoy the beauty. We also have the exposure of death and pollution. We see all of that. But so enjoy what you have now. But in the future, it will be no more. The earth as we know it. And the heavens are going to change as well. Now, John now talks about in Revelation 21 too. He mentions this. He says, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for a husband. So in the next few moments, we're going to be talking about the New Jerusalem. I'm going to try my best. I'm going to read the scriptures as we have. Some of the words I cannot pronounce, so I may need you to help me pronounce them. But the idea is to kind of paint the picture of the New Jerusalem. Okay? The New Jerusalem. Um, someone has said, this is where all the believers who die in Christ will go. So if you, if you die and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're going to heaven and you're going to be living in the new Jerusalem. All right? You're going to be living in the new Jerusalem. So let's talk about the new Jerusalem. He says, the term made ready seems to imply that the new Jerusalem has already been completed. Now, what did Jesus say when he left? I go to prepare a place for you, right? But what did he say before that? Right before that, he said something else. He says, in my what? Father's house are what? Many dwelling places or many mansions. If it was not so, I would have told you. But I go to what? Prepare a place. So you think Jesus is still working on this? 
<laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, he, John is talking about it like it's already completed. You know, it's like a, like it, it's like a coming down like a bride adorned for a husband. Since God dwells in the third heaven, we can conclude that he has prepared this city to eventually become the capital city of the final state. So this, this city that we'll be talking about is coming down out of heaven. It's coming down out of heaven. And it's a city. Okay? And I say, apparently when the new heaven and the new earth are finished, the new Jerusalem will come down out of the third heaven where it will make already, sorry, where it will have already been completed. Where Christ told his disciples that he's going away to prepare a place for them in John 14, 3. He may have been referring to this incredible city. So, let's look at its identification. The capital of heaven. You may ask the question, okay, remember we talked about Ezekiel and John? They saw a throne, and then they saw, what was the first one? They saw a throne. I need to go back. And, what is it? You remember the two, two, two things they saw? The throne and what? A temple. The throne and the temple. This is the other structure now. This is called the city, the new Jerusalem. Now, there were three Jerusalems. There were three Jerusalems, or there are. The historical Jerusalem, which we know of today, and we know the history of that Jerusalem uh, from the time that when David wanted to build the temple of the Lord, but the Lord didn't give him that opportunity. He gave it to Solomon. Solomon built the temple. From that point, Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. And from then until... This time, you talk about historical Jerusalem. Then you have the millennial Jerusalem, which is where when Christ comes and reigns upon the earth for a thousand years, he will reign in Jerusalem. And then there's the eternal Jerusalem, and this is where this new Jerusalem now we're talking about. He says, which I believe will be the capital city of eternity. <laughs> the right of Hebrew says, you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the myriads of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are rolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous men made perfect and to Jesus. And so he's talking about the city of the living God, the new Jerusalem. So the dwelling place of Christ's bride. Are we the bride of Christ? You all believe that, right? So guess what, guys? This is our home. This will be our home. You know, some of us in this life, we, when you look and you compare, you may say some people live in a better place than others. But here, all of us will live in this new Jerusalem. So the new Jerusalem is described as a, br a bride adorned for a husband. One of the greatest ways to express beauty is to liken someone to the beauty of a bride. Um, let me ask that question. Guys who are married, when you all got married, was your wife, the beauty, you saw the beauty of your bride? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and for ladies, you, you kind of stir the heart of the man. I've seen in some of those little videos on social media, the guy just breaks down and crying when he sees the gal coming down the aisle. He just can't contain himself. He just, you know, he collapses under emotion. But the reality is, <laughs> you know, that's the beauty of the bride. Such a designation reminds us that, that the church, Christ's bride, will dwell there. Revelation 19.19 19 tells us that when the saints conve convene in the Lord's presence, they will attend a marriage supper. And in Revelation 21.9-10, 9, an angel says to John, Come here, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to the great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. So we saw this city just coming down out of heaven as a bride adorned for a husband. Although the New Testament is uniquely identified as, sorry, although the New Testament is uniquely identified as the bride city, New Jerusalem, sorry, is uniquely identified as the bride city because of the church, I believe that the saints of all the ages will be there, Old Testament saints, the church, and tribulation saints. But if that is true, why did John uniquely identify that as the bride city? The book of Revelation was written to comfort the persecuted church, persecuted Christians in the first century read about a city that belonged to them and they, give, and was, they were given comfort and hope. So we have this, this city. 
Now, we're going to try to describe the city, okay? We're going to try to describe the city because that's what it does in Revelation 21. In Revelation 21, 9 to 10, he saw that the angel took John in the vision to a mountain to a new, to a new, on the new earth from which he could watch God's masterpiece, the capital city of the infinite heaven, descend from God out of heaven. So think of it. The new heaven, the heavens and the earth as we know it, is no longer. There's a new heavens, new earth. But then John sees a city coming out of heaven to this new earth. And it's almost beautiful like a bride. And so John is now going to describe the city. So the glory of the city. John describes the city as having the glory of God. And the essence of the eternal heaven is that God's glory is manifested in it. Now, there's only two, I think, two um, instances in Scripture where we see the glory of God. Remember we talked about one of them last week was Moses. When Moses asked the Lord, I, I would like to see your face. And God says, you can't. But you can see the backside. So he hid him in the cleft of the rock. And as he passed by, Moses' face lit up. And he had to wear a veil to hide it. So that's the glory of the Lord. But when you also see, when you see Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, when he just unveil his glory and what was Peter's response say so good that we are here let's build three tabernacles because what Peter saw was overwhelming but we don't know we haven't seen that I don't know if you've seen the glory of the Lord I haven't seen the glory of the Lord as yet but can you imagine if heaven is this is the essence this is when God's glory and we're going to see how that un unfolds and Isaiah 60, verse 19 says, No longer will there be, sorry, no longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor for the brightness will the moon give you light, but you will have the Lord for an everlasting light and your God for your, all your glory. Now, I want you to think about this because I was trying to think it through when I was trying to describe this. I have a picture here. Some of you will try to show it to you for those online. You ever saw what they call a prism? You ever seen a prism? You've seen it, right? When you have a light shine onto the prism, which is a clear crystal, it shines off multicolors. Okay? We could show this around. Um, we just pass it around. And what the idea is this. The glory of the Lord is going to shine through the New Jerusalem. Okay? So when he shines through, it kind of what? Blazes with all kind of color. And it's going to give a beautiful... That's not a description of the New Jerusalem, okay? That's just a prism that you can probably look at. So, it says here in Revelation 21, 23, The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine upon it, for the glory of the Lord has illuminated it, and its lamp is the Lamb. So God himself will light all the infinite heaven, particularly the sparkling celestial jewel, called the New Jerusalem. And so he uses words like this. John tries to describe it. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, a stone of crystal, clear jasper. He's talking about this idea that the, the, the city that is coming out of heaven, it looks like a clear crystal, clear crystal. And the glory of the Lord is going to shine through it. And as the glory of the Lord shines through it, it just blazes into all different colors. All right, so think of it like that. <laughs> and so he saw the eternal city coming down from heaven, and it resembled a sparkling crystal, diamond like stone, blazing with the glory of God's very nature. And the sparkling, the splashing light of God's glory literally covered the infinite universe with breathtaking beauty. You know, I've kind of looked on, I don't know if anybody else have a, a book or some sort of, you know, those uh, Bible charts if you can find what people try to draw what this city look like you know um, most of them couldn't I, the ones that I look for they couldn't come up with uh, they, they showed the city but it was not blazing bright because when you shine the light to this prism it kind of sheds all this light now the design of the city in Revelation 22 12 to 22 sorry 21 12 to 22 5 John attempts to describe the undescribable. It's walls. He talked about his walls. Now think of it this way. It's a city, 
And I'm going to give you the dimensions of this city as well. Verse 12 says that it had a great wall, great and high wall. The wall probably symbolizes security and protection. In ancient times, people expected cities to be safe and secure. So we see here it had a wall around the city. Okay, it had a wall around the city. And, um, but in Revelation 22, 14 and 15, it says, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of light, and may enter the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the adulterers and everyone who loves and practices lying. Those people cannot enter this city. And you hear in portions of scripture, Paul would say, Paul would say certain people, he, he described a number of people, immoral people, and he says they will not inherit the kingdom of God. So you're not getting in. If you're a liar, swindler, idolater, homosexual, infeminate, and then he goes on, a, um, covetousness, a drunkard, he says these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. You can't get in. So it has a wall to protect itself. But those people will not be there. Their people will be in hell. So the walls and the gates testify that some can enter and others cannot. The wall is 72 yards, and some people say wide, which actually means 216 feet wide. Okay? According to human measurements, which, which are also angelic measurements. Human measurements are the same as the angelic measurements. Along the walls, now think of this, you have a walls, and as you see the walls, four walls, 12 gates, and at the 12 gates, 12 angels, and the names are written on them, which are the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. So we see, you have three gates, it'll talk about it, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the east, three gates on the west, and on those names, on those gates, were the 12 names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. Since the gates of the bride city are named after the 12 tribes of Israel, exhibiting God's eternal covenant relationship with Israel, that leads us to conclude that Old Testament saints will be there. Apparently, 12 is the number of perfect symmetry. 12 gates, 12 angels, 12 tribes, 12 foundations, 12 apostles, 12 pearls, and 12 kinds of fruit. And John records that there were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. And gates imply that people leave and enter the city. And don't think that the city contains us forever. We have the infinite, we have the infinite universe to travel, and when we do, we will go in and out through those gates. Now, this is the author, and I, next week, and the week, or the week after, we're talking about what will we do there? What will we do in heaven? Um, we'll just go through what scripture teaches us. But the thing is, we're not confined. This is just the city. This is just the city. This is not where, it can be what you would call, this is where you live, but this is not where you're gonna stay, okay? So, Verse 14 says, the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. God is identifying himself with the new covenant people. Notice that Jesus is referred to as the Lamb. He will forever be known by his sacrificial name. And so we looked at, we see the wall, and then the wall has 12 foundational stones. And then on those 12 foundational stones will be the names of the 12 apostles. That's why we say there are no apostles of the Lamb today. No apostles of the Lamb today. We may have apostles of the church, but we don't have any apostles of the Lamb because there were 12 special men called by Christ, chosen by Christ. Their names are on the 12 foundation stones. So if you have someone get up today and say, I'm an apostle, you probably is an apostle of the church, but not in the same category as the apostles of the Lamb. Because your name is not going to be on the foundation stones. <laughs> it's already taken. <laughs> All right? So let's look at his measurements. In verse 15 and 16, John says, the one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod, probably about 10 feet long, to measure the city. He's going to measure the city now. He's going to measure its gates. He's going to measure the wall. And the city is laid out as a, out as a square. 
and his height is as great as his width. And he measures the city with the rod. And how far is it? 1,500 miles. Okay, let's think of it. It's a square, right? It says its length and its width and its height are equal. So it's 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles high. Huh? That's a big city. What is 1,500 miles? Up. 1,500 miles up. That's already into the, past the atmosphere, right? Eh? We're, we're probably somewhere in space somewhere. Then it's 15 miles that way. And 15 miles this way. Someone actually tried to try to locate it. And so it this is a map of America. And they tried to draw the, fifth, the square, 1,500 miles. They say it, it takes up almost half the American continent. Because why? It's 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long, and 1,500 miles up. That's a big city, right? That's a big city. John describes the city as a perfect symmetrical 1,500-mile cube. In Solomon's temple, the Holy of Holies was a cube of 20 cubits. And the new Jerusalem in the, is, is the Holy of Holies for eternity. Now, according to Revelation 21, 16, the new Jerusalem is 1,500 miles long, wide, and high. That means it contains 2.25 million square miles. Amazing when you consider that greater London today is 621 square miles. The city of London is, is one square mile and has a population of about 5,000. On that basis, the new Jerusalem will be able to house over 100 billion people. That's a lot of people, eh? How many people are presently alive on planet Earth today? They estimated it. Almost 8 billion, because it's 7 billion some. But it's almost 8 billion. So alive today, if you have 8 billion people, and then all the people from this time to the past, all of them add them all up together, all of us could fit in this city, comfortably, comfortably. It is large enough for the few who find the narrow way, but it won't confine them. This cube, having the same dimensions as the distance from Maine to Florida, apparently has multiple levels and millions of intersecting golden avenues. It is a place of incredible majesty and beauty. You know, you can't wait to get there to see what it looks like. You know, it ain't gonna be like the city of Nassau, which is, you have know, confined spaces at times. When you get up there, I mean, it's amazing, this particular city. It holds, could hold 100 billion people. But just like Jesus said, there's only few that can find the way. So out of the billions of people that live from Adam till now, and then until the Lord comes, only a few will inherit this. But it's a beautiful city. What is it made out of? Its materials. It says, Revelation 21, 18 says, the material of the wall was jasper. Boy, I looked up jasper, and if you look at the present day jasper, sometimes it looks like a reddish color. But it wasn't a reddish color in, in the day that John was there. John says a transparent, it's a diamond-like stone. Remember I showed you this, the clear crystal? So the, the material of the wall was like a clear crystal. And when you shine the light through it, it kind of blazes it out. And so the transparent stone will allow the glory of the God radiating from the center of the city to shine through. And verse 18 says, the city was pure gold like clear glass. What color is our gold today? It's a yellowish color, right? But this gold here is what? Clear glass. It's gold, but it's clear glass. The gold we're familiar with is certainly not clear. What John saw must have sparkled with a brilliance and glow that, that had a golden tune, but was still crystal clear. In addition, in our glorified bodies, our perceptions will be different. Something 
could be both solid and transparent. In his glorified body, Christ walked through a wall. So even though he had a body, he can still move through physical objects. And so this gold is gold, but it's a clear gold. And we don't have clear gold on this planet. We have a yellowish gold. Both Ezekiel and John describe much of the heaven as being transparent. The radiance of God's glory reflects the beauty of his presence throughout every diamond facet. Meaning that, you know, it looked like a diamond. I have a picture here of a diamond. Um, when you look at the diamond, and the light shines through a diamond, it just gives off all of that different color of light. And so if you can imagine if this is the New Jerusalem, and it's a clear golden crystal glass, and when God's glory shines through it, it just sparkles with brilliant light. Now, I'm trying to describe the undescribable, like John them did. And in, John, in verse 17 it says, the foundational stones of the city was adorned with every kind of precious stone. And this is where I can need your help with. The first stone was Jasper. Now he's given the stones, there's 12 foundational stones. And he's given you the idea of what the colors would look like. The first foundational stone was Jasper. The second, Sapphire. The third, Chalcedon. 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 The fourth, Emerald. The fifth, Sardonyx. The sixth, Sardis. The seventh, Chrysolite. The eighth, Beryl. The ninth, Topaz. The tenth, Crystal phase, the 11th, Jacinth, Jacinth, and the 12th, y'all can help me with that one, Amethyst, right. Those colored jewels along with the transparent glass, diamonds, and golden hue form a picture of an unbelievable and indescribable beauty. God has planted within us a love of beauty, and heaven's surpassing beauty will satisfy that love forever. And because of some of the names of these gems have changed through the centuries, it is difficult to identify each one with certainty. Eight of the 12 stones are found in the breastplate of the high priest in Exodus 28, and the other four may also relate to the breastplate. The gems picture a brilliant, indescribable panoply, panoply of beautiful colors that send forth the light of God's glory. And so the following are possible identifications for these gems. And what I did was I kind of list them, and I gave you the color that was associated with it. The word jasper, rather than the modern day jasper, the term actually refers to a completely clear diamond. A perfect gem with the brilliant light of God's glory shining out of it and streaming over the new heaven and the new earth. The, sar the sapphire is blue. The chardonnay sky blue color, emerald, green, sardonyx, layers of red and white, sardis, which from an orange red to a brownish red to blood red, crystallite, which is a transparent form or yellowish tone, beryl has several varieties ranging from green emerald to the golden yellow to a light blue, topaz, yellow or yellow green, Crystal phase, that's what you'll call that. Crystal phase, it's an apple green. Jacinths, which is red or reddish brown. <laughs> and the last one, BJ, what that is this? Amethyst, which is a clear quartz that ranges in color from a faint purple to an intense purple. Now, those are all them colors. I just, the colors, you know, it's, I don't know what that looked like, but I know it's beautiful. And if you have light shining through a clear crystal and this is shining bright, 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 that's what this city looks like. The beauty of the city. The beauty of it. And then he adds, the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each one of the gates with a single pearl. So each gate had a pearl. That's a big pearl. And that's one for each gate. And the street of the city was what? Pure gold, like transparent glass. Now, even though we're talking about gold, it's clear. And John doesn't tell us how big the gates are, but each one is a pearl. Hey. Mm-hmm. 
You can see yourself, but yet it's, yeah, it still has that yellow. Yeah, it's polished, yeah. They use gold. Yeah, but uh, boy, I, I, I can imagine if you can actually have someone sit down and think it through and draw this out and color it, I think this would be beautiful. It may, it may not be the, the final product, but it'd be something that is majestic and beautiful. And I think that's what we're looking forward to. We're looking forward to a place that when the heavens that we know it and the earth as we know it is no longer, God brings in new heavens and a new earth, and out of this heavens comes this city. Beautiful, transparent, cold, colorful, blazing. It's amazing, you know? And the distinctions of the city is a temple. John says, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. So heaven's temple is the presence of God. And then he says here, it's light. Where, where do we get the light to light this particular temple, this city? The city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of the God has illumined it, and its light is the Lamb. So the presence of God and the Lamb will light the entire city. In fact, Isaiah said the moon will be a base. Sorry, the moon will be a base, a base and the sun ashamed. I don't know if we can have a sun in that in the new heavens. I don't know. I don't know if we have. I don't know if we need a sun. I don't know if we need a moon to reflect the sun. I don't know if we have those things. But when we get there, we could find out. Okay. In Revelation 21, 24, as that the nation shall walk by its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it. John is saying that even the kings of the earth will give up their give up their glory for the glory of heaven, and all the nations will walk in the light of God's presence, and all men, regardless of their positions, will bow to its glory and so we're looking forward to this time when we actually get into this city its security it says here verse 25 it says in the daytime very interesting for there will be what no night there anyone will go sleep i don't think we will sleep in the, in the eternal state you know does god sleep we sleep because we get tired we need some rest but in that eternal state, I don't think we will sleep. It doesn't say. But there's no night there. Its gates shall never close. In the ancient city, the gates were shut at night to protect the people from robbers, bandits, and invading armies. Gates that are always open speak of perfect security and protection. And in verse 26, it says, they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Nothing will rival God's glory. So they leave the gates open. There's nobody to... Your security is intact. You don't have to worry about going home tonight and locking your door, cutting on your alarm. There's no need for an alarm no more. You'll be insecure. And the citizens, in verse 27, John says, Nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever enter into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Make sure your name is there. That's why John number was saying, test the spirits, examine yourself, see if you're in the faith. Because if your name is not in the Lamb's book of life, you're not going there. It's refreshments. It talks about in Revelation 22, 1 and 2. The angel shows John a river of water of life, clear as crystal coming from the throne of God and then of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. In Eden, there was a beautiful river that watered the garden. And here we find that in the New Jerusalem, a clear, crystal clear, celestial river flows out of the throne and through the middle of the city. And so there's a city which streams make glad the city of God. So we have this, you got to worry about that. you got to worry about it. It's refreshing. Imagine what a river meant to someone living in a barren place like Palestine. It was a welcome place or comfort and rest, refreshments and sustenance. A river meant cool water to a mouth parched by the desert heat. The New Jerusalem will be the epitome of everything precious. A city, a river, and trees. Now, do we have any rivers here in the Bahamas? No, right? We don't have no rivers. 
<laughs> we had lakes, but all of those are salt water, right? There's no freshwater lakes. But then the thing about it is the city, we have a city. There's a river and trees. If you're living in Palestine, I remember when we were in, in Jerusalem, uh, as we were traveling through, Israel was into this, um, I'm not sure when they started or if they completed it, they were planting trees. They planted a lot of trees. The reason for that was that when the Turks, Ottoman Turks took over, they were charging everybody for every tree that you have in your yard. They charge you tax on the trees. That was years ago, yeah. And so what they did is the people cut down all the trees in their yard. And the place became almost like a desert. So Israel came and they came and they planted trees. And the trees provo provided shade and refreshment. And especially if you have a river flowing, it provides even more refreshment. In heaven, we will eat for enjoyment, not substance, sustenance. You believe that? We eat and we have a problem with eating, right? But in heaven, we will eat for the joy of eating. Now, when Jesus was here and he sat down with his disciples and he ate, did he eat so he can sustain himself? He ate just for the sheer enjoyment. You know, can you imagine that? You eat and never put on weight. <laughs> you could enjoy the food and don't put on no weight. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now it says here the Greek word for healing in the, is, you see the therapy, yeah? Which we get the English word therapeutic from. John is saying that the leaves of the tree of life promote the enrichment of life. They are for the pure joy of eating. And the water of life is for the sheer of joy of drinking. No food will be needed in heaven, but all will be enjoyed. Now, it's fellowship, because we're wrapping this up now. What's that fellowship is like? The Apostle John continues. There shall be no longer any curse, and the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his bond servant shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. And there shall be no longer any night, and they shall not have need of light or of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God shall illumine them, and they shall reign forever and ever. There's no longer any curse. And there's the throne of God, and his born servants shall serve him. That's what we'll be doing. We'll look at that when we talk about what we'll be doing in heaven. You know, a lot of us think that when you get to heaven, all you're doing is you're just sitting down playing a harp. You know, your white robe playing a harp. That could be very boring. But I don't think that's what heaven is about. You know, but we will be there. We will enjoy the presence of God. Um, we enjoy to some limit here in your personal experience with God. In your reading of his word and prayer, you enjoy a certain presence. But when we get into heaven, we will enjoy his presence because he'll be there. First Corinthians, First Thessalonians 4, 17 says that after the rapture, we shall always be where? With the Lord. Seeing his face implies intimacy, communion, and fellowship. Having his name on our forehead speaks of his ownership. Because remember, we talked about that at, at the thing at the first lesson on heaven. We mentioned the idea of how if heaven is precious, sometimes when you think, when you talk to people about heaven, they won't go because of the place. But we go because of the person. We go because of the person. We go because of God, and we go because of our Lord. We will see him what? Face to face. You know. John is saying that, that, and you see where my note there, I made a mistake. Thank you, Brother Milton, for correcting that. John is saying that sinners will fellowship. You see that? <laughs> no, that's wrong. John is saying that believers will fellowship intimately in the presence of the Holy God forever. Christians speak of being with the eternal God, of having intimate fellowship with Christ, or being joined heirs with Christ. They assert that they will judge. They, they assert that they will judge the world and rule with Christ. All those statements would be blasphemous if God had not promised them to us. He told us that we will be joint heirs with Him, and we'll see Him as He is, and we'll be like Him as He is. So that's. As best as we could describe the New Jerusalem, 
Um, can anybody give me a, a city that you went to that you were really, really taken aback by when you saw it? And you say, wow, this is beautiful. You ever been to a city like that? No? Okay. You may have had some experience where you like, whoa, this is really nice. You know? But I think sometimes when we, when we get to glory, when you close your eyes in death and you believe in Jesus Christ and you open your eyes, you'll be amazed. Remember the song that we used to sing kind of regularly? I can only imagine. We only can imagine. We can only try to describe it as best as we can. But we just do not know. We just do not know. So let's ponder the principles. In 2 Peter 3, Peter graphically describes the certain destruction of the present heavens and the earth. It's ironic that, that what many people focus on will all be destroyed. In fact, the Apostle John uses that as a part of his argument against loving the world. In 1 John 2, 5, 17, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father. But it's of the world. And the world, what? Passeth away. Just as we will pass away, this world will pass away. And so we ought not to love it. And the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Are you becoming attached to what will eventually be burnt up? If the world has influenced your values and attitudes, obey John's directive. Stop loving the world because it is passing away and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. I think we need to get back to that. In our Christendom, and in Christianity today, we're so engulfed with the here and now. And we had that conversation about a week or two ago, the other lesson. We talked about you could be so heavenly minded, but no earthly good. But we have a lot of believers who are so earthly good and not heavenly minded. And so I think we need to refocus and think through that, hey, we need to, this world is passing away. This world is eventually going to be all gone. We enjoy the things in this world. We live in this world. We enjoy the grass, we enjoy the trees, we enjoy the beach, we enjoy the environment, we enjoy the people. We do, but we have to live with a pilgrim mindset. We're not here to stay, right? We buy land, we build houses. But can you imagine that generation that buy land and build houses in Nassau, the Bahamas, and when it says the islands of the sea will disappear? All that real estate. All of West Ridge gone. Life a key gone. The value no more. So we need to think through our values and also our attitudes. Ask God to change your values and attitudes and confirm them to His Word. Conform them, sorry, to His Word. So that's the best that we could try to help you through what we see in Scripture to understand what the New Jerusalem would look like. Because we're going to be passing from this life into eternity. We're living for eternity. Like someone said, we're living for life and eternity. We live for now, but we live with the view of eternity. And so we hope that that's what our goal is. So even as we live now, when we do the work of the Lord, we do it with heaven in mind. Amen? Well, you'll have to read that on your own. And as you read it on your own, I hope it will encourage you to look forward to the new heavens and the new earth and also the new Jerusalem. Let's pray. Father, there's a lot that we've talked about tonight. And um, we ask, Lord, that you, through your word, will speak to our hearts. Because I know, Lord, that a lot of us are attached to this world, the things of this world, and we live in this world. But as John said, that this world is passing away. We're seeing your hand in destroying the earth as we knew it, as 
in the days of Noah, so that the people who lived during the time of Adam to the time of Noah, those who were living at that time, perished. And the earth was changed. Now we're living in a different environment, but now this environment is now being prepared for fire. Help us to think through and evaluate and go back on the promises of scripture because you promise that you will create a new heavens and a new earth and they will endure before you. So help us that our focus, our attention, our values, our preparing for eternity will set our minds on these things. Bless us, Lord, we pray. And may your word speak to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.